Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you back to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder. So many things brewing going on in the world today. It's crazy trying to keep up with everything. There's a new whistleblower out. His name is Cody. One of my listeners recently sent me some information about him. He was a guy that was in the military, associated and working for the CIA, has some stunning information on the destruction of the Oklahoma the Oklahoma City bombing in the Murrow building and how they were there were records in that building related to Gulf War syndrome, related to some of the corruption of Bill and Hillary Clinton and um it's it's a stunning story. I'm gonna to try to get him on the show. There's a tremendous fire that's going on in LA um, try to get to that. Um, I'm going to try to get a, a whole group of of guests together too. I got so many things going on outside of Ohio exopolitics right now too. So it's kind of hard to follow all of this. You know, Billy Billy Meyer. He is a 80 year old man who lives in Switzerland in a tiny mountain village called Hinterschmidruti, which is about 45 minutes east of Zurich. He lives in the beautiful pine forests and snow-capped mountains of Switzerland. He's 80 years old now. He's written about 50 books. Uh, some of his books include The Might of Thoughts, The Way to Live, The Psyche, The Goblet of Truth. Uh, the book that I first just mentioned there called The Might of Thoughts. Like all of his books is a bilingual book. Uh, the title of the book in German is Mach der Gedanken and then if you look through the book you'll see on one page the English and on the other page the German. So let me read a little bit in the German in, excuse me, in the English in, the, in a section here, I think you'll find interesting. It says here, That which the human being thinks, he or she makes real. And that which the human being thinks about himself or herself, he or she becomes. So, you know, we've talked so much about how our thoughts are so important and that our thoughts become reality. In other words, good thoughts good feelings, good habits lead to good circumstances in your life. However, also in addition to that, what you think about yourself also becomes real. I'm going to, I have a clip here I want to play just for a, just a little briefly, and it, it's somewhat related to what we're talking about here. Uh, if I can get it to come up. Excuse me here. Maybe we're not going to play this clip. This is this is um, this is from Ask It, Billy's second second contact, and I'll just play a little bit of this. It's one of those. Voices that is hard to listen to, but then we'll get back up with the show here. Piety and pleasure and contact reports, conversations, volume one, pages 303 to 308. Ask its acquaintanceship, just as with the introductory explanation. All of the following was written down together and with Ask its help. Ask it constituted a very good memory aid for me. Furthermore, she was in a position by means of some some sort of apparatuses, to reproduce words, true to the original words, which had already been spoken a long time ago, whereby, with the writing down of the following reports, I am in a position to reproduce truthfully, word for word, 
every single spoken word and every sentence from her side or from my side. The apparatus. So Billy, Billy was involved in first his meetings with Svas, secondly his meetings with Askit, thirdly his meetings with Semyase, and then later in life, Bata and Quetzal. And there was a a technical device in place that would help him get the get the information down exactly. And in the case with Semyase, the ship would literally send the information back to Billy to his conscious mind, which he would then type out. Um, Billy also has the ability to get information what are called called from the storage banks. There's a storage bank around our planet, storage bank around our solar system, storage bank around our galaxy, storage banks associated to the universe. And the universe, the universal consciousness, is sending signals all the time. And when Billy was growing up in Switzerland, before he had any contacts whatsoever with Askid or with Spoth or with Semyase, he was picking up on these signals. And as a young boy... At about 3 a.m. one morning on a mild night in May in 1941, he Billy went outside and he sat down on a bench and he looked up at a beautiful starry sky. And he heard a voice in his head that said, My life is made out of the love of creation. And he also heard himself say, Since ancient times I lived among the stars. And he he didn't know where this information was coming at first until later he recognized that these impulses were coming from the storage banks and these good memories started to penetrate him. And so this was the beginning of kind of Billy's spiritual um, journey when he started to learn how to pull these impulses down from the storage banks. Um, Billy eventually, and this was when he was very, very young, started to meet with Svath, which was an extraterrestrial human from the Playar and Star System. And Svath was about a thousand-year-old man. He wasn't a Pleiadian. There really is no life in the Pleiades. These people live about 80 light years beyond our Pleiades in a different space-time configuration. So there are seven different space-time configurations in our universe, and you could think of these different, uh, like different rooms in a house. And they, they're each a little different, but they're like a variation on the theme because in our space-time configuration, there's a Sierra system, there's a... Uh, Lyra Vega system, it, just as there is in Svat's space-time configuration. So not only do these extraterrestrial humans travel from star to star, but they move in and out of these different space-time configurations. So uh, Svat's people at this point were very, very advanced, and they were nearing the stage which is called life and creational wisdom. And at that point, people lose the need for a physical body, which is an amazing thing. We reincarnate over millions and millions of years, from, from some, between 40 and 60 million years, we reincarnate into a physical body. And these people, these Playaren, are at the stage where most of their society is no longer needing to reincarnate into a physical body. And this call, this is very, very interesting because most people say, well, why Billy? Well, it's because his spirit form is very, very ancient. And he's compatible with their uh, thought emanations with the signals that come out of their their brains 
where we wouldn't be. And in fact, our impulses, our vibrations, if you can tolerate that word, would not be compatible with them whatsoever. We would, we would, and this is one of the things that happened to Simyasa. She, she suffered a great accident because one of the other people there in the, in the um, Simyasa Silver Star Center walked in on a discussion between her and Billy. So this is why we can't have open contact with these people. We're just a little too under-involved for this sort of thing. So this is uh, one of the great difficulties that we are facing. We are on a path right now here in the United States, and I'm kind of jumping all over a little bit today. Uh, We're on a path that may lead to civil war, may lead to the destruction of our nation. And the only thing that has a chance, the only thing that can give us a chance is the right thinking. So we have to gain control over our thoughts. And this is the most important thing. Learning to gain control over our thoughts to start thinking in a way that allows us to live peacefully with each other despite the difficult difficulties and the intensities that are going to come down the uh, pike. I have a quick clip I'm going to play um, about Michael Savage, who is one of the authors that have been writing about Civil War for, for a little while. So here we go. Alex, the thing is this. We've been penetrated. We've been infiltrated. How high up it goes is anyone's guess. We know that the president's middle name is not Jesus. We know that the military has been told to stand down. We know the police have been told to stand down. We know that there's only one sacred religion in the United States of America, and it isn't the founding religion. It's the invasive religion. And the fact of the matter is, the FBI director who warned us six weeks ago, this was just before Hussein's uh, conference, anti-terrorism, counter-terrorism conference in Washington, where he invited Muslim groups. He disinvited the head of the FBI who said that ISIS is in 49 out of the 50 states. Why would he do that to the head of the FBI who warned us? There's only one answer. Someone in that team in the White House is playing for the other side. They're not on our side. Now, of course, the good news here, Alex, is when I saw this terrible event last night, the good news is the beefy Texas cops killed the scum. So what we've got is a situation where by 2020 the United States could could break up. And uh, I was talking at Beanley Show about this fellow Cody who was in our military, was in the CIA, and uh, just another person who is coming forward telling us about this incredible corruption, the corruption of the deep state, the corruption um, that is occurring in our country. Uh, See, Sfoth told Billy, even when Billy was a very, very young boy, that we were heading into the time of the third millennium. And this is a time of confusion that will pass over the earth. It's a kind of time of confusion and maliciousness, a time of transition. And when, again, when Billy was about five years old, uh, this silvery pear-shaped craft would land close to Billy's home. He would walk out, and uh, Billy would say he was brought up into the ship as if by ghostly hands. And Swath would tell Billy about his previous lives, that he had been the people that we call Enoch, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Emmanuel, and Muhammad. And that during each one of these lifetimes, he taught an ancient spiritual teaching called the teaching of the spirit. But it was never written down. So in this lifetime, it's been written down in these incredible books that I was telling you about at the beginning of the show, the Might of Thoughts, The Way to Live, The Psyche, and Goblet of Truth. Now, there's like 50 other books 
that have not been translated yet. And the intention of the spiritual teaching is to wake the human race out of their sleep. The teaching of the creational truth, according to the Meyer information, will eventually become a worldwide movement. It will bring peace, love, freedom to the human beings of the earth. So we are in this transition period right now. Spots told Billy that there would be two atomic bombs dropped on Japan. Uh, Spots told Billy that he would lose his left arm, that many people would turn against him. And Spots also showed him something called spiritual telepathy, which enabled Billy to receive information from this spiritual plane called Arahat Atherasata. Billy's first contact was with Svath. It lasted about 11 years. Uh, his next contact was a, with a woman named Askit, who was from the Tao universe. The Tao universe is a parallel universe to ours. It was created at the same time our universe was, about 46 trillion years ago. Her people, Askit's people, are called the Timmers. And she, Askit was here to be Billy's mentor for about 11 years. So it was she came in about 1953, I believe it was, and would she sent a robotic craft to Switzerland, and, and that craft picked up Billy, sent him to the Middle East, and where he met with Askin, and they went far below the Great Pyramid to these old cubicle constructions, which were about 73,000 years old. And that's where he saw the headquarters of the Bafath, who are also called the Giza Intelligences, and asked it explained to him that these people were using religion to manipulate the people of the earth and to confuse us. Which is very interesting, because if you, if you look at our religions today... Uh, it, it, it's a staggering thing. It's, it's it's difficult to even describe what has happened to us with the religions over time. There is um, so much important information related to this. I, you know, I often talk about uh, the the origin of the letter J because I, I had the hardest time. Uh, in many ways, accepting that that we could be so wrong about the central person of the Western civilization, who we call Jesus Christ, and one of the one of the things that blew me away was when I learned that the letter J did not exist in the ancient world. So all these people to, that we call John or James or or Julius Caesar, or Job. They were called different names in ancient times. There was no J in the Hebrew, no J in the Aramaic, no J in the Greek. Uh, they usually, these, these words were pronounced with the letter I or the letter Y. For example, uh, the book of Job was originally the book of IOB. And the person we call Julius Caesar today, his his name began with the letter Y. Now, if you look at a 1611 version of the King James Bible, you'll see the name I-E-S-U-S. -S. This is because this was, I think there was a transliteration that was done. You know, a translation is when you take a word in one language and you find the equivalent word in another language. But if you have a word in one language, and there really is no equivalent word in the other language, sometimes what they'll do is uh, go letter by letter and try to find the equivalent letters in the, in the language that they're translating to, and that's called a transliteration. Well, there really was no way to even make an accurate transliteration. Uh, the Meyer material tells us that the name of the person we call Jesus Christ today was originally called Emmanuel. Now, Emmanuel appears, the name appears in 
in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, and also Isaiah 7, 14, if I have my memory on correct this morning. So it, 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 the name, his name, it says his name will be called Emmanuel. Uh, one, of, one of those verses, I wish I had my Bible here, it says, uh, the virgin will give birth to to a baby, and his name will be called Emmanuel. Well, it doesn't say his title, but all of the religions today say his title will be Emmanuel. His title was Emmanuel, which means God with us, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's not the way it's translated. It's not translated that way in any of our Bibles today, because I think that there's just a tremendous amount of confusion in Religions today. Uh, so his name couldn't have been Jesus because there was no letter J in the ancient world. In fact, the letter J didn't even exist in the English language until about 1550 or so when a guy named Gian Giorgio Tarissino, uh started substituting the I and the Y and the Y for the letter J. And this is a something that I've covered before and I talk about, but I think it's so important to remember this because we think that our religions have the bottom line and they are, um, we have been, I guess if you could call it mind controlled or intimidated. Uh, let me, let me just play this. It's a little quiet and, and then we can go from there. J is the youngest letter of the alphabet. The letter J is roughly 500 years old and was not part of the ancient Greek, Hebrew, or Latin alphabets. By way of contrast, the ampersand, a combination of the letters E and T, is 2,000 years old. The oldest letter is O, which has been with us for 3,000 years. J descended figuratively and literally from the letter I and was used to give a consonant sound to the letter I. Consider how the letter A sounds differently depending on the word it is used in, baby or bath, for instance. At one time, I might have been used to sound both like I or like J. Important political and religious figures whose names started with the letter I lived before the invention of the letter J, and today their names are commonly spelled with a J rather than with an I. Julius Caesar was born in approximately 100 BC, and Jesus Christ was born in approximately 5 BC. Some scholars believe that names that began with I were pronounced as if they began with Y, and pronunciations evolved over time. To some people, there are religious implications in the spelling of religious names. Of course, there are no recordings from these time periods, and scholars must rely on ancient texts for guidance. Any books written before 1600 had no J's as we know them. In 1455, Johannes Gutenberg invented movable type, which some consider humankind's greatest invention. Gutenberg's first name likely started with I because he was born before J's were used. Copies of the Gutenberg Bible still exist, and in it Job, for instance, was spelled I-O-B. Similarly, the 1611 edition of the King James Bible had no J's, but 1769 editions of the King James Bible had J's. Some credit Italian playwright and scholar Gian Giorgio Cicino, who was born in 1478 for the official split of I from J. Cicino wrote that the consonant J should be a distinct letter from the vowel I. Similarly, Cicino wrote that the vowel U should be separate from the consonant V. Both ideas grew in popularity, and thus we have J's and U's.
That's a life-changing uh, YouTube video. Uh, it's, it's stunning. There was no letter J in the ancient world. There was no letter J in any of the ancient languages. Now, there's different takes on on what happened in the ancient world just before Christianity got really popular. Now, one of the stories you hear is is the Council of Nicaea, which uh, got together, I believe. The first Council of Nicaea got together, and they were trying to come up with the name of the new Christian God. And um, so Constantine's intention at Nicaea was to create a unified Christianity. And he brought together all of these leaders in Christianity together in a place called uh, uh, Nicaea. And this is part of the Roman Empire. Constantine had become a Christian, and he wanted to have all of Christianity united on the name of the, the teacher that we all call Jesus Christ today. They didn't. They didn't agree. They at that time what his name was, and this again is still debated on how much of this happened. And anyway, uh, when these People got together. They were brought together by Constantine in about 313 A.D., right around the Edict of Milan time. Um, because before that, Julius Caesar was hailed as God made manifest and the universal savior of human life. So now they had to kind of remold the people's thinking. So there were these heated debates between all these leaders that Constantine brought together. And they they got together the names of 53 different gods. Uh, they never could come to agreement. So Constantine had to step in. And he gave the name of the new god, Jesus Christia, Krishna, which is the official name of the new Roman god. And they actually voted on this name. And, and, and the vast majority finally did agree you got to remember, there were no letter J in in, any of these alphabets. So, it's very, very interesting. Uh, Over time, Jesus Krishna became Jesus Christ. And so, this is is how this happened. And and I'll just run through some of the, the the equivalent of the Greek letters and the equivalent of the modern of uh, the Hebrew letters, for example, um, the Greek letter you have alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, eta, theta, iota, kappa, lambda, mu, nu, xi, omicron, pi, rho, sigma, tau, epsilon, phi, chi, psi, and omega. No letter J equivalent in any of those. In the Hebrew, you have al, bet, gam, dal, he, wa, zan, het, spet, yad, kaf, lam, ma, nun, sin, gan, pe, sad, ku, paros, shin, ta. There is no equivalent of the J in those languages. So he couldn't have been called Jesus Christ during his life. There was no letter to represent that sound. So he may have been called Yeshua. He may have been called Isis. He may have been called Hesnus Krishna originally. Um, I think that was a combination of the Eastern Savior God, uh, Krishna, and the Druid God, Hesus. Uh, So what, what Constantine was trying to do was unite Christianity in Rome, come to agreement on what this fellow's name really, really was. Now, the Meyer material says his name was Emmanuel, and he was a he was a great teacher, and he taught things that were a lot different than what we have in our New Testament now. Um, seeing as they didn't even get his, they couldn't have even. We don't even have his real name now passed down to us. 
it is no longer a stretch for me to believe that a lot of the information in the New Testament isn't correct. One of the things that Emmanuel was supposedly have taught was the immortality of the human spirit. In other words, we live many, many, many lifetimes. Our spiritual consciousness dies. Each lifetime, we get a new personality, a new consciousness, and a new physical body. And we live 40 to 60 million years in a physical body, about 20 to 40, I believe, in a half physical, half spiritual body. And then we spend billions of years in a purely spiritual form, uh, evolving up through these levels, starting first with Arahat, Athrasata, and then going up seven levels. And that takes billions of years for for that whole process. Eventually, we merge back with the universal consciousness. There is no God in the sense that the religions teach. There is no God the Father. There is no one up there giving you commands and demanding anything of you. There is an intelligence behind our universe that's involved in the evolution of our universe. It is in the in the Greek, excuse me, in the uh, in the German. Billy's writings are all in German. Uh, I got Greek and Hebrew on the mind right now. Uh, the word, the term they use in the German is Wiesenheiten. It's really not a translatable term into English. A Wiesenheiten is an intelligence that's more like uh, our gases or our ocean. It doesn't have a personality. See, you and I have a personality, our cats and dogs and horses and all you know, we're so used to a personality. The universal consciousness has no personality. It radiates love. Its life cycle is very scheduled. It's automatic. It follows a fixed schedule. Its free will is not associated with its evolution. We can speed up our evolution or slow down our evolution by based on our own free will. The universal consciousness, its self-determination doesn't affect its evolution. It functions also without a personality in that sense. It is like a juggernaut grinding forward for evolution. That's what it's all about. It radiates love like our sun radiates light. It, The incredible splendor of nature is the visible expression of its love. It's not a God the Father. If you go up and jump off a building, you're going to be killed. A, a father intervenes to save his children when they're stupid. The universal consciousness will not do that. Maybe it looks at things completely differently because it's been around for 46 trillion years. It knows spirit forms reincarnate into physical bodies, learn lessons. Some of these lessons are very harsh. Some of them involve death. Um, so given that we live in a reality that's like that, in other words, where we're responsible for everything that we think and everything that we do, and we have to take complete and total responsibility for ourselves. There is no Savior that's going to save us. There is no God the Father that's going to save us from our stupidity. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't a supreme intelligence in our universe. There is. There's a universal consciousness that is evolving as our universe evolves, it creates human spirit forms to live physical lifetimes to gather information. We're boots on the ground for the universal consciousness. We live lives so that our spirit forms gain wisdom and knowledge. So your purpose in life is the evolution of your consciousness to gain wisdom. The flip side of wisdom is love. The highest principle 
in all creation. Love is the highest principle in all creation. And through it, everything exists in absolute logic. There's a complete logic related to everything. Everything has a purpose. Every tiny plant and every tiny animal fulfills its purpose in love. Love will forever be the purpose of our existence. Uh, This consciousness that is evolving, our universe radiates love, but it doesn't operate like a thing with a personality, like a father. It's not going to save you. You have to be responsible for yourself, and you can be. That's the good news, because the power of our thinking is incredible. And you have to learn how to harness the power of your thoughts. Because what you think you make real, what you think about yourself, you become. So tell yourself, I'm confident, I'm optimistic, I'm relaxed, I'm cheerful, I'm thankful, I'm enthusiastic, I'm in harmony. I persevere, I persist, I endure, I am calm, I have hope, I am the master of my own destiny, I am the forger of my own fortune, I create my own good luck by my good thoughts, good feelings, good habits, and those create good circumstances in my life. I'm the master of my own destiny. I'm the forger of my own fortune. What I think I make real, what I think about myself, I become. I do not let the environment and the circumstances form me. I form the environment and the circumstances of my life through my good thoughts. My good thoughts, lead to good feelings, good feelings lead to good habits, good habits lead to good circumstances. In your life, in my life, we are the master of of our own destinies. It is the nature of thoughts that by their might alone, every conceivable thing can be brought into fruition, good and bad. So you don't want to be thinking negative thoughts because Negative thoughts disturb the psyche. Negative thoughts first disturb the feelings and then the psyche. So pay attention to your feelings. Your feelings will tell you what your thoughts are. And then you can stop these thoughts from running away. The negative thoughts will make you miserable. Neutral positive thoughts will bring in happiness and cheerfulness. So tell yourself, I am happy. Think of yourself as being wise because you are wise. You have an inner counselor called your innermost creational nature. And this innermost creational nature sends impulses to your material consciousness, evolutive impulses. And these evolutive impulses are causing you to grow spiritually. The evolution of your consciousness is your reason for existence. And there is the other reason for your existence is you play a role in the evolution of creation. Uh, Creation is not a god. It's not a father figure. It is absolutely without gender. It is both positive and negative in complete uh, equality. Creation is neutral. Its power and its wisdom is the greatest in our space-time structure. So this universal consciousness is also bound to a higher creation called the Ur creation. Our creation goes through 
thousands and thousands of evolutionary steps, 10 to the 24th power evolutionary steps. And our creation is at the very beginning of its evolution, even though it's the highest intelligence in our universe. Uh, One great time, which is one step in the evolution of the universal consciousness, is 300 and 11 trillion years. Uh, we, the universe is in its expansion phase. It will expand for 155 trillion years. Well, that's what we're in right now. We're in the 46 trillion year, which is a contrast in, when compared with the life of a human being that may live 50, may live 100 years, may live 120 years. Uh, possibly our the structure of our universe quickly uh, is like a it has seven counter rotating bands in a roughly elliptical shape and these band bands they rotate one against the other we live in the fourth layer which is the material belt that's where the planets and the suns and the stars all exist. The third belt is called the earth space belt. That's the belt before the matter belt. And you have to understand that the the material matter belt goes on for thousands and millions and billions of light years of space. And that is not the the space ac- aspect of the universe is not all, everything. It's just one belt, one counter rotating belt. If you if you've ever looked at a tree stump with its concentric circles of rings, that's what our universe is like. It is these concentric circles that counter rotate against one another. Uh, the universal consciousness, the universe. Um, These are all synonyms. So it's, we're talking about a spiritual energy that exists, a spiritual energy that is evolving. Um, It has a creation, spiritual energetic evolution. The human being has a conscious evolution of our consciousness. Uh, Animals, apes, dolphins, horses, dogs, cats, etc., these kind of animals have an intelligence evolution. They do involve... uh, Animals do eventually get a kind of intelligence. And there's also an instinct evolution uh, that that occurs in animals. Um, Human beings... um, We evolve our consciousness, and we evolve our consciousness by learning certain spiritual principles. And these principles are in Billy's books. One of these books is called The Way to Live, the Art Suleben, which teaches us to be honest and benevolent and don't turn your back on yourself. Do not have self-chastisement. Do not abuse yourself. Have no feelings of inferiority. See, so we we have feelings of inferiority, and we also abuse ourselves when we make mistakes. You should never. You should allow yourself to. You should forgive yourself. Don't have feelings of inferiority. Care for the health of your body. Challenge your body and and your mind. The other trap is do not devote yourself to your passions, your lusts, your addictions. Use your intelligence in the fulfillment of your responsibility. Then you'll have true um, enjoyment. In order to really have enjoyment, you have to strive. Following your addictions, whether whatever those addictions may be, uh, following uh, if your goal in life is pleasure, 
you won't have much pleasure. <laughs> if your goal in life is to evolve, if your goal in life is to strive forward, then uh, happiness will be a natural evolution of that activity, assuming that you stay in a neutral, positive balance. Whoever devotes himself to his passion, to your addictions, you finally run through the desert like a person dying in the desert. If the, if, if the human being does not pay attention to himself or herself, and one of the ideas here is to fulfill your duty to yourself. And fulfilling your duty to yourself involves forming your exterior, you know, taking care of yourself, dressing well, grooming yourself well, uh, never losing confidence in yourself. You need to fulfill your duty to yourself. Uh, never be despairing. Always consider yourself as wise and skillful as others. Uh, do not think low of yourself. Nothing in the whole universe, there's nothing that is not connected with you fulfilling your duty to yourself. Um, you should not let yourself be controlled by your desires. Do not want to play the leading, shining role in any organization. Uh, boredom is the death of all initiative. Whoever falls prey to boredom falls prey to addictions, vices, and goes astray. Um, if you're bored, you're looking at things in the wrong way and you need to reevaluate what you're doing. Another thing is forgetting. Forgetting is a blessing. We should, we should, we we forget generally the memories of our previous lives, which is a good thing. We also have to keep in mind that we have within us something called the false eye. And the false eye attempts to complicate everything. And, and your false eye is essentially threatened by your existence. I'm your, your evolution. I'm going to play a quick uh, clip about love here. And, and, and this, I think, is important. Excuse the, the, the uh, non-human sounding voice here. Love teaching, let her know. 27, another great saying that comes from love teaching, let her know. 27, page 296. The love of creation is everywhere, because without it nothing at all would be able to exist. The individual should therefore be aware that he exists only through the love of creation, and that he carries this love also within himself. For more information read, Love Teaching Let Her Know. 27, page 296 For more information read Fig Post about Love Teaching Let Her Know. 27. Each smallest plant, each ever so tiny animal was created in love by creation, each creation existing according to the same law of love. All life is in the absolute perfection that which it should be through the love of creation, and except for humans, every life form lives exactly by this creation's plan. Only humans have turned away from love and must now learn again what true love is. The infinite love of creation connects all life, because in all life this love lies hidden. The universe that we live in is the material. This is the importance of love, and we don't understand love. We don't realize that the universe is literally radiating love. Uh, there's a beautiful passage in the Goblet of Truth which goes like this. It's entitled, What the Truth Knows to Say. And it says, bushes, trees, stones, rivers, everything that crawls and flies on the earth is a life form with a spirit form. And these spirit forms are on a journey through time, which involve many, many lifetimes. And death is just the passage to rebirth, 
rebirth into the world, into the spiritual world. And many of these creatures are connected by psychic vibrations. And they're aware of each other. And they communicate with one another. So if you go into the forest, you can watch the birds as they fly as a unit and turn on a dime. You can listen to the crickets and and listen to the these living creatures communicate with one another. If you've ever seen schools of fish travel as a unit. Because everything in the universe is one and it's all bound together. And every aspect of creation fulfills its purpose in love. And see, there's this great oneness to creation. But because we have a free will as a human being, because we have to be able to evolve our consciousness, so we have to be able to step outside of this love and step outside of this purpose in order to really evolve our consciousness, to be able to understand the difference between uh, living outside of, of creation's plan. An animal cannot live outside creation's plan. It just fulfills its purpose automatically. The same with the plant. It fill, fulfills its purpose automatically. And But we as humans on this earth are not living and fulfilling our true purpose to evolve our consciousness. We're on this uh, treadmill of either living to fulfill our addictions and our lusts or living uh, to fulfill the materialism that's a part of our society. So our whole consciousness is ill. We are a people that are ill in our consciousness. And only learning to control our thinking can really set us back on the right path. So let me read this passage again, and this is from the Might of Thoughts. It says, That which the human being thinks, he or she makes real. And that which the human being thinks about him or herself, he or she becomes. So if you allow yourself to have bad thoughts about yourself, you will become that person that you most dread and most fear. So you should think in positive terms about yourself so that you become that person, that positive person, that wise person, that person which loves humanity and and loves nature. You can be a guide. You can be a very happy, wealthy, wise person. But what you think about yourself is part of fulfilling your duty to yourself. And remember, you need to be your own best friend. In any case, it is absolutely always necessary that good and positive thoughts are tended and nurtured and that the human being also holds a good and positive opinion of him or herself. So if you're a person out there that's listening to this show and you've occasionally had horrible opinions of yourself, regardless of what you've done. And I'm sure we've all done. I know I've done some things that are just not good at all. We have to do not punish yourself. You need to have a good opinion of yourself. Because what you think about yourself, you become. What you think about yourself, you will become. So, the human being always determines and forges his own destiny. Consequently, he or she never ends in the gutter as a result of tyranny, as a result of the terror imposed by others, or or because of some kind of circumstances beyond your control. Rather, solely because of the might of your own thoughts, through which you live your life and the circumstances of your life are determined by the might of your thoughts. Lower thoughts, wishes, desires, and yearnings, and so forth, lead to lower results. However, healthy, higher, and neutral, positive, equalized thoughts 
bring success. So you really are the master of your own destiny. You are the forger of your own fortune. You create the good circumstances in your life by your own good thoughts. You are the master of your own destiny. You are the forger of your own fortune. One of the things more than anything else that controls your happiness is your willingness to strive. The creation itself, as well as all its creatures in Wiesenheiten, is imbued with the power of this striving in order to attain success the future progress and that which is higher. Striving is the power of the spiritual as well as the physical. And striving is an incontrovertible creational law. In order to reach through incessant evolution that which is higher and absolutely more developed, your happiness depends on your striving. Without striving... There is no happiness. There's no sense of life without striving. Striving, if the striving is absent in some life form, or if you slow down on your striving, then the power of the progress extinguishes, and thereby the sense of the life. If a human being loses his or her striving, then he or she loses his sense of life. So go back and look at your life. Are you losing your sense of happiness, your sense of purpose, your sense of life? If the human being can no longer strive for anything at all, then he or she feels with deadly might that he or she is no longer of use to anything and that the human being, he or she has become impossible. So you always have to focus on your striving. Striving is the actual nature of the human being. Isn't it good to know this? Isn't it so important to know this? Striving is the nature of the human being. You will not be happy unless you're striving. If your nature is nullified, then the human being feels that he or she does not have a place in the world anymore. Rather, he or she has to vanish from it. If the striving breaks down in the human being, then he or she becomes incapable of life, displeased with life, suicidal. So if you are faced with a time in your life where you're very uh, depressed, look at your thoughts. Are they neutral positive? Tell yourself, I'm confident, I'm optimistic, I'm relaxed, I'm cheerful. Return your thoughts to a neutral, positive balance. And then get striving, because striving returns you to your sense of life. Well, I hope, I know this show has been all over the place. Uh, You know, whenever you're evolving, there's something that's going to oppose that evolution. It's always unique, and it always occurs. You can be sure that there is always the positive and always the negative. The positive and the negative are two forces that belong together and should not be separated because that is what creates the neutral balance, the equalized balance in your life. Have a great day. I hope this show helped you. We'll talk again soon.